From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dollar? Mr. Dollar? Oh, oh, listen, it's after midnight, and I don't feel so good. This is Tim Beasley. I want to talk to you. Oh, the oh-so-very-uncooperative mayor, chief of police, and general do nothing in this town. Now, just a minute. Now, you just a minute. I asked you for help this afternoon in finding out who's threatening to put Meg McCarthy in a restaurant out of business. Dollar. What do I get? A snide warning from you that the people of Cod Harbor don't want outsiders messing in their affairs. Well, I don't believe it. If you'll only listen to me, I want to help you. Then why weren't you here a little while ago when somebody slugged me? I was. What? Who do you think picked you up in that alley and put you to bed at Meg's place? You? You want to come over here and talk to me now? I know it's late. Okay, Beasley. If my head stops spinning long enough, I'll be right over. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location, Cod Harbor, Massachusetts... To the Intercoastal Maritime and Life Insurance Company, Boston. Assignment, the Meg's Palace matter. Expense account continued. Expense account? Well, so far here in Cod Harbor, there's been little need for it. Meg McCarthy had given me a small room above a restaurant and provided all the food I could eat. My own two feet were the only means of transportation. The only shops were along the waterfront, but they were suppliers to the boats tied up at the various docks. And a motley lot of boats they were. Some were big schooners dating back to the last century and still carrying sail. There were power boats of all shapes and sorts and sizes, from 18-footers with one-lung gasoline engines to big 60- and 70-foot diesel jobs. Trouble of the sort I'd come to investigate seemed out of place in this otherwise peaceful little village. Come in, Mr. Dollar. So, you've suffered a change of heart, huh, Beasley? And you've decided to go off with it. Yeah, that's about the best way to put it, I guess. See, it's now this wait, way. wait, wait. Before we go any further, what was this bit about picking me up after I got socked on the head a while ago? Listen, Mr. Dollar, after you left here this afternoon, I got to thinking. Maybe I was wrong in giving you the back of my hand, and maybe you was right in walking out mad like you did. Well, how would you feel? The insurance company back in Hartford gets word from Meg McCarthy that somebody's threatening to burn up that joint on the waterfront she calls a restaurant. It's insured for $15,000, and she's insured for twenty five. I know, I know. Well, you see, it's this way... And when I get here, I learn that somebody has already tried a couple of times to set fire to the place. All right, all right. I learned a long time ago that in a case like this, it's smart to enlist the help of the local authorities. Here in Cod Harbor, those authorities all seem to boil down to you. Why, I will never know. Yeah, like I told you. But now listen... And what do I get from you? The cold shoulder, the back of your hand, as you put it. I, I, I got to explain to you, Mr. Dollar. Well, then go ahead and explain. And believe me, brother, it better be good. Well, there, there probably ain't another village like this in the whole country, see? Technically, well, we're supposed to be part of Barnesboro, a few miles inland. But we've always left them alone, and they've always left us alone. Any trouble happens, we settle it amongst ourselves. And because we're such a small place, uh, it's get along with everybody or get out, see? So we just don't have no trouble. Um, not of any account, that is. Unless it's somebody comes in from outside and makes it for us. You understand, Mr. Dollar? Are you forgetting it was one of your own townspeople who asked me to come here and for her own protection? That's what I got to thinking about after you left. So I decided maybe I'd better talk to you. And, well, that's how I happened to go over to Meg's place tonight. Was that you I saw in the shadows out by the front door? Yes, sir. I, I was waiting for Captain Billy Morgan and his crew to finish cleaning up the place for Meg. And I was going to go in and talk to you. And that's the truth, Mr. Dollar. Come on. Well, I just got there when I heard a noise out at the side of the cafe like a fight. Of course, it was dark. There was no fight. Somebody came out the side door from behind me and knocked me on the head. Yeah. So I took you up and put you on your bed and gave you time to get your senses back and then telephone to you. Uh-huh. 
You sure it was you out at the front of the cafe? Oh, no, Mr. Dolly. You trying to implicate maybe it was me that give you a belaying pin over the head? Was that what hit me, Beasley? A belaying pin? Well, well, well something hit you, and I just... Okay, well, okay, I'll take your word it wasn't you, for the time being. I swear, Mr. Dollar, by all... All I... right, then, listen. Yeah? I heard that side door open just before I started seeing stars. Huh? Yeah? That means whoever struck me must have come from inside the cafe. Say. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. The only people inside were Captain Morgan and the crew of his fishing boat. You sure? I'm sure, because I was in there myself just a minute before. Just Billy Morgan and his three men. Where was May? She'd gone up to bed. I just stepped outside for a breath of air. Holy. Huh? Holy Jensen, first mate. Yeah, I heard Captain Billy call one of them Holy. Well, his name's Jensen, huh? And then there's Charlie. Charlie Button's a deckhand, and Montgomery, the engineer. Well? No, no, not one of them could have done it. Isn't that like saying I didn't get hit? One of them must have done it. No, sir, Mr. Dollar, it just couldn't make any sense. All right, tell me this. Are any of them related to the guys who run the other cafes along the wharf? No, no. But you are, aren't you, Beasley? Huh? To Clem Harris at the silver plate, or is it the greasy plate? Anyway, he's your cousin, isn't he? Oh, I told you that. But if you think he had uh, anything... Right now, I don't know what I think. Well, let me tell you this. If you have suffered this big change of heart, it's about time you started proving it. I, I'll do anything you say, Mr. Dawn. All right. Meg seems to think the threats and attempts to burn down her place came from her competitors. Well, I know she does, but she's... Now, in a couple of hours, I'm taking off at the fishing banks with Captain Morgan and his crew. Maybe I'll be able to spot which of his men laid me out in the alley, if it was one of them. Meantime, you see if you can dig up anything that would put a finger at the other cafe owners. That means Ernie at the manor house, Tony who runs Irving's chop suey joint, and your cousin, Clem Harris. Okay, Mr. Dollar, I'll do it. Hey, by the way, did you ever check their handwriting against the letters Meg received? Well, no, I never quite got around to it. it... I don't think you ever got around to doing anything. But <laughs> it's such an easy job. Well, do it. I... Get the letters from Meg and check them. Yes, sir. I'm going to try to get a couple hours sleep before we take off on the Lily Ann. Yes, sir. The big lazy slob. The first time I met him, he'd actually boasted about his soft job. About how nicely he could live in the town without having to lift a finger. Oh, sure, the sudden change of heart may have been genuine, but I wouldn't have bet on it. And I still had no proof it wasn't he who slugged me. And one of Meg's rival eateries was run by his cousin. But then everything indicated that whoever struck me had come from inside her own cafe. So I decided it was more important than ever that I go on the next day's fishing trip. Back in my room on the second floor of Meg's palace, I fell asleep the minute my head hit the pillow. And I could have sworn it was only a second later that... Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh. who was it? What is it? Time to get up and out. What do you think it is? Huh? Who uh... was you're going out with the boys. Just get them lazy bones of yours up out of that bed. Oh, but it's still pitch dark. Are you decent? Well, whether you are or whether you ain't, it's time you was up. Here's the light for you. Oh, oh turn that thing off. Now, yeah. here's some coffee. Take a saucer or two. It'll choke you. It's that strong, but it'll wake... <sighs> Johnny boy. What happened to you? Oh, just what it looks like. But your head... Somebody just got real friendly with a belaying pin right after you went to bed. They come up here and attacked it? No, no, it was outside. Out by the side oh, door. I'll kill whoever done that to you, Johnny boy. So help me, I'll find out who done that. I'll... Are you sure you want to get up and go out to the banks? Maybe it's... No, just... no, I'll be all right. And I think it's pretty important I go out with Captain Billy and his boys. Because I have a sneaking suspicion one of them may have done this. Why, them dirty, conniving... Oh, no, Johnny, you must be wrong. Oh? Why, don't you know, darling, that's the finest crew of men in all of Cod Harbor. I'm not so sure. But then you... You mean you think one of them could also be behind trying to burn me down? And maybe me with it? You can be mighty sure I'm going to try to find out. Oh, Johnny, boy, I pray that you're thinking wrong... Anyhow, if you're going with them, well, up and out with you. By the time you're in your clothes, I'll have some grits on the table for you. Eggs and pork chops and donuts and jam and hot cakes. I met the crew of the Lily Ann at that breakfast. Breakfast? Considering the amount of food set before them and the way they piled into it, you'd think those four men hadn't eaten for a month. And I must confess, there was nothing about them that looked like cause for suspicion. 
First it was Charlie, a tall, brown-eyed, husky young fellow. Alert and pleasant with a sense of humor, and he was obviously liked by the others. I don't know, Mr. Dollar. I think you just got to dreaming about some nice, pretty gal, and when you reached out and tried to grab her, you fell out of bed, and that's the way you got banged up. <laughs> Montgomery, a bit older, the man who was responsible for the engines on the boat. Gray-haired, lean, wiry, with gnarled fingers that looked clumsy and somehow never made a clumsy move. Whose blue eyes looked straight at you when he spoke. Don't you believe it. And you can blow me down, Mr. Dollar, if that ain't the most dastardly thing I ever heard of here in Card Arbor. Now, you best stick close to us that's your friends whilst you're here. I said, friends of Meg McCarthy, be friends of us. Then Ollie Jensen, first mate, the oldest member of the crew. Quiet, calm, and efficient. The soft-spoken one. Uh, it's not for me to inquire why you're here, what business you're about, Mr. Dollar, and I don't. But I'm certain it's for the good. And any help that we can give you, you're welcome, sir. And I say the devil with all this chitter and chatter when there's fish at sea for you to catch, you lazy lunkers. Get up from that table and get to work. By the time the sun's up, the fish will all be out of your reach. Within a few minutes, we cast off and the Lily Ann put to sea. Slowly, the lights of the little village disappeared aft. The moon had gone down, and our only company out in the dark water was the twinkling stars and the occasional running lights from the other boats setting out for the fishing banks. Captain Billy Morgan stood at the wheel. Montgomery sat athwart the engine cover and occasionally made some slight adjustment or indicated a change of throttle to the captain. Young Charlie and Ole made ready the two small boats and trot lines. For today, we'd go for codfish in the deep that lay along the edge of Taylor Banks. I stood alone up in the bows, looking over the curling wash as it scattered the myriad microscopic beings and gave a soft phosphorescent glow to the water gliding past. And I wondered. I wondered why there had to be trouble in this world, where honest labor by honest men could do so much more. Honest men? No. Not even among this crew. One of them had to be the man who'd attacked me. Was probably the one who had threatened to burn Meg McCarthy out of business. So I better have at it. I'd better get back aft, talk with them, watch their every move, try somehow to trap one of them into saying something that would give them away. Or maybe, who knows, give all of them away. And above all, watch my step. There was a long way back to shore. And the darkness and the sound of the engines could all too easily cover up an untoward act by one of them. It did. Before I could lift my head, a powerful pair of arms had picked me up bodily and dropped me overside. In the brief moment that I remember, I felt the strong tug from the big propellers as the water closed over me, then a terrible blow against my side. Then nothing. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the motives for arson and murder begin to take definite shape in the form of a confession. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. (laughs) 